I was mentioning before the service to those who gathered for the pre-service prayer this morning, that the way that these messages come together very often changes, it differs. Sometimes it, it, it's through a lot of reading and, and praying and this and that, and it, 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 you can see stuff coming together. But every now and again, and it feels like more and more it's, it's happening where I would sit down and, and pray, and this has been processing for the week or whatever, and then when I really have time, okay, let's see how all of this comes together. It's, it's really almost as, I, as if I have a front row seat of just seeing this message just flow, and it, it literally, it just goes. So when I sometimes say I'm so excited for this message because it's such a good message, it's not because I think it's such a good message, it's because I heard it yesterday for the first time as well and it was good. Because I really feel that the Lord has a way of bringing all of this together and it's just like, yo, because it's not me. It's, it's, I'm useless and I think because I know that the Lord is able to work because a tool should only be a tool. And in saying that, I don't mean it in a funny sense. I just feel that the Lord wants to do something this morning and I'm excited. And it's going to start with a, a large disclaimer essentially when we start and then it's going to funnel down, but it does have purpose. So just bear with me. I do feel that the Lord wants to do something special this morning. But as we start, I couldn't help but think this week about people who are great. Now, we've, we've all heard the stories about people such as David with David and Goliath and and. Jeremiah and these great prophets and, and maybe even Samson who at, at one stage eventually clicked and then he gave his life fully to the Lord, if you will, in realizing who he is and what the Lord wants from him. And he stepped up to the plate, if you will, taking up what it is that the Lord has called him for. So this is one form of greatness that we see and we can maybe envision ourselves like maybe like that would be amazing, but that's not for me, that's for those people. Um, it's, it's not what the Lord has laid on my heart. I'm not gifted enough for that. Okay, that's fine. Let's put that thought on one side. And then you have what we call earthly success or greatness, where we have all these people gathering together for the Olympics, and we see them succeed above all else and, and win that gold or be the best in whatever it is that they are trying to achieve. <clears throat> now, regardless of where you find yourself on this greatness scale, if you will, this morning, I feel the Lord wants to speak to all of us about what it means to step out in faith according to the calling that He has placed on each and every one of us. And no, this is not a fluffy message to encourage you and God and you're going to change the world. Just bear with me. As you know, we've been working through the book of Colossians. For those of you who don't know, we like to work through books in the Bible um, because it gives us context of what the whole letter is about. I feel it teaches us about how to interpret Scripture correctly without taking stuff out of context. But at the same time, I feel that the Lord has, has structured this in such a way where we can learn as a church. And very often, fun fact, it also takes the me out of the service because I can't say, okay, listen, I've got this message for you, by the way, because it's what's next in the letter. It's what that church also needed. And it, it sort of takes me out of it as much as... I can. Um, and I'm thankful for that. So as we've been working through the book of Colossians, we're just past halfway now. We've seen how this book started off with Jesus is everything. Stop adding, stop taking away. Jesus is all that we need because there was this group of believers who essentially were thinking that Jesus wasn't enough because they were trying to add their works to their salvation. Because if, if, if I do this, then I can you know, be worked. Or if, if I'm circumcised, then I'm fully saved. And then you have the other end of the spectrum where people were just saying, like, God is so great, like, I don't need to do anything. And that's sort of fine because Jesus wasn't really him. He's still coming. We're still waiting for the Messiah. And Paul was just saying, no, 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 Jesus is everything. Then we moved on to understanding how we see in First Colossians 1.24 that the Lord saying, listen, we are continuing the suffering of Christ through the church. Not, not because he needs to do something still more for salvation, but what he wants to do for his people. There's something that we are still continuing in how we are taking this message of salvation to the world. We also sort of spoke about very much how we need to die to ourselves. On the one hand, for our sinful natures, but then the more difficult part, our personal aspirations or hopes. Because it's no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives through me. It's, it's His will and His purpose and His church. And in doing this, then He will give us what we need. 
and our heart's desires because that's who God is because he loves us but he first wants us to die to ourselves and then in dying to ourselves as we discussed over Easter weekend and last weekend we were speaking about how we need to lift up and be raised from the dead into this new life putting away our sinful nature and actually living according to the will of God and taking up what he wants to give us. And now Paul sort of walks more closely as he's writing this letter. He starts speaking about the how all of this comes together and the what this actually practically looks like in practice. Because it's one thing for us to say, be better. You need to love one another. Stop lying. But what does it look like in daily practice? And this is where... We need to start looking at those Olympic athletes, if you will, because we can look at those Olympic athletes and think to yourself, wow, what a moment of greatness. It took you 10 seconds to run from there to there. It's 100 meters. And that is greatness, but that's not the true greatness. The true greatness comes in the hours and hours and years of focus and practice and and sacrifice that it took to get that person to the Olympics, to get them to that spot. That's the true greatness. It's not that one event or that one World Cup, that 90 minutes of the World Cup rugby that got us to greatness. It was the years and years of sacrifice, of reconditioning, of reshaping our minds to get us to a certain spot. That is true greatness, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. So I put a disclaimer at the beginning, and for some reason, maybe, I'm not apologetic about it, I just don't want people to be closed off beforehand. Just wait. When I offend, because I probably will, as I was offended. As I mentioned before, I got this message yesterday for the first time. I was the first one to realize, ah, I don't really like it. And then I realized it's true, so I need to like it. So we're starting off, we're carrying on from Colossians 3 verse 18, and it reads the following politically incorrect sentence. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting to those who belong to the Lord. For those of you who were at EC Equip, Eastern Cape Equip, when we gathered together as churches, you realize that, that Paul, uh, the, not Paul, our Paul, essentially, Andrew was literally taken to the Human Rights Commission for preaching this. Wives, submit to your husbands. And then the sentence, as is fitting to those who belong to the Lord. Which essentially means, if you don't submit to your husbands, you're not fitting to belong to the Lord. That's a difficult sentence. That's a very difficult sentence to understand because it's difficult to understand because we have these questions that immediately crop up. But no, he he fails. He does this thing. But before I carry on, I want to sort of share the story of I was speaking to one of my students, um, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. For those of you who don't know, I teach English over the internet and I was speaking to one of my students and I was I was sharing with her how excited and thankful I am to have Sophia as my wife and as the mother of her children because she is a phenomenal parent. Like to the highest degree that I can't even dream to aspire to be that type of parent. Not that I think that I'm a bad parent, but like I really think that she is so good. She has such a good heart. She has such a wisdom to how she interacts with children of all families, not just ours, but there's I look up to it in such a beautiful way. And as I mentioned this to her, I got the strangest response. Because I was saying like, because we were speaking about gender roles in in the workplace and the family and whatnot. And I said, well, listen, if we had to choose between either my wife being the, 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 let's call it the full-time parent and me being the breadwinner financially, I most definitely want to give that job to my wife. Not because I think that she's inferior, but because I do think that she's a better parent in certain aspects than myself. And her response sort of floored me. I was a bit taken aback. She said, are you saying you won't help? I'm like, that's not what I said. You're sort of going in the wrong. I'm saying I think my wife is very good. I'm not saying I'm useless. Oh, okay, so you can't do anything. That's not what I said. And it literally took about 40 minutes of discussion where we were able to come together in helping us realize what happened. Because what we sometimes do, we all do this. I'm guilty. We have a conversation with someone, but because you've had five conversations like this before, you think you know where this is going. So you immediately preempting like, I want to cut you to the chase. Don't, don't even think about being a lazy parent. And no, that's not what I'm saying. You, you, you've been preconditioned with what you've seen in the past. Now, before I share further, please don't be preconditioned with 
useless men not stepping up to the plate, with people abusing their wives. And don't, hear what I'm saying. And it's not even me saying it. It's the Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit speaking, because I think we so easily lose track of the question. The same happens when we start speaking about church leadership and things, but I don't want to digress too much. But the question is not about ability or value. There's given an instruction, submit to your husbands. It doesn't say because they are better, because they are more worthy, or because of anything. It says submit because that's what the Lord wants. It's also not asking you for your opinion. In the same way, it's not asking me for my opinion. Because very often I can say, if it was up to me, then I don't agree. But it's not up to me, so I need to change my way of thinking to the way that the Lord wants to hear it. And this is what we need to understand. Because women are just as valuable as men, and we should never negate that. This is true. But that's not the question. Husbands do fail constantly, miserably. We do it. Guilty as charged. I'm standing at the front. I'm raising my hand the highest. But that's not the question. And I also need to say that there's no conditional in when it says, submit to your husbands if they are worthy, if they make you tea. If they bring you flowers, that is not the question. We need to submit to everything up until the point where it contradicts what the Lord says in his word. Because God is our ultimate authority. And then I have this final thought that just came up to me when I was doing my notes. I struggle to understand that women very often struggle with this. Once again, politically incorrect, but you said yes, twice. <laughs> you, you, we are not forced into marriage. We said yes when he asked you, would you be my wife? This is what it means to be a wife. Yes, we always understand afterwards, but we need to understand. And then in front of our whole families, we also said yes again. And so did the husband. By the way, you're not scot free. Just wait. Just wait. You're next. Um, so please just wait. But I need to stress this. We need to understand that we agree to this. We can't change the terms of the contract or the agreement after the fact. It shouldn't be this way. And then I discovered something very interesting. I was reminded of it. Did you know that the fact that women's yearning to want to control their husbands is evidence of the sinful nature and the fall of man. If we can look at Genesis 3 verse 16. So after the fall of man, God starts giving his punishments, if you will. He says to the, to the snake or to the serpent, he says something, and then he speaks to the woman as well. And he says, then he said to the woman, verse 16, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. It's literally part of our sinful nature that we need to combat. This is a result of the fall. That we want to have this power and this authority that God hasn't placed on us. And by the way, before we start thinking, but you know, I don't want to be the helper. I don't want to be inferior. Did you know that the same word to describe the creation of Eve as a suitable helper, that word helper, it's called Ezer in Hebrew, is the same word used for God in Exodus 18 verse 4. We need to understand that there's no way we are speaking about different values or about positions. It's saying your role and your authority. This is your position. This is what you have currently to do. In the same way, when we start looking at the Trinity, you have Jesus Almighty being equal with God, but yet submitting himself to the Father. And you have the Holy Spirit submitting himself to both the Son and the Father. We need to understand that submission does not mean I am worthless. But the first thing that happens when we start discussing these topics, our insecurities and hurts and the past starts cropping up. That's not the question. God loves us. We are both equal. We are both, we have the same ability to large extents. 
But we need to understand that when there's a specific role, there's a specific role. I want to carry on in reading Genesis 8 or 2 verse 18, and it says, Then the Lord said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper. That same word that is used for him in Exodus. Who is just and right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose the name for each one. So this is Adam naming each and every kind of animal. He gave names to all the livestock and the birds in the sky and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. This would be a good space to have that inclination of, I'm offended, like God first wanted him to have a cow, so like, I'm the last pick. <laughs> but wait. Once again, don't let our insecurities and sadness and pain from the past cloud our judgment when we're reading Scripture. I feel the reason God is doing this is to make known to us that God didn't want him to have someone to fulfill a function as an animal or a donkey, drawing, you know, when you're plowing or something. That's not the reason for the helper. Because then a cow or a donkey or whatever would suffice. That's not what Adam needed. Adam, oh, men, pay attention. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out of the man's rib and took out the man's rib and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, This is the bone from my bone and the fresh flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she is taken from the man. And this explains why a man leaves his father and his mother, which is funny because they didn't have fathers or mothers, and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. We need to understand that we as people are not good alone. It's not opinion. Regardless of how you might feel, God Almighty said it is not good for man to be alone, despite the fact that's how we feel very often, especially men. But God tells us it's not good. And then another thing that was given in wisdom by one of our friends a long time ago, he was preparing a message and someone said, I don't want to be the helper, it makes me feel inferior. Very often, the other day, let me use that example, we had someone to come and fix our fridge that had broken. He was my helper. He was skilled in an area that I was not. I needed help. We need to stop reasoning from insecurities when we read these things. God loves us. If you are the helper, it means that you are skilled in an area that they are not. But yet, we are called to submit. And that's where the true challenge comes in. So women, ladies, whether single or married, understand that God loves you. You are equal. And when the Lord says submit, when you are married, that it doesn't mean that you need to be a slave. We'll get to that now. But it does mean that we need to submit to our husbands. And submitting to something to do practically is a choice that you are going to have to make on a daily basis. And it's not going to happen by itself because as we saw it's a sign from the fall of man. Next up, husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. So easy to say, so difficult to sometimes do, because we as men can sometimes be very difficult. We can. We can be short. We can reason that we don't do it on purpose, and we don't at times, but sometimes we're just mean. It's very easy for us as men to bulldoze our wives. But we shouldn't. Because once again, we need to submit to the Lord and realizing that we need to love them. The way that we treat one another is not the way... We need to treat one another the way that, the, that God wants us to treat one another. And I want to expand a bit more on this in actually going to Ephesians, because otherwise I feel that we're getting different air times to the woman, to the and the husbands, and we need to understand this a bit better. Ephesians 5 verse 1, speaking about the same topic, 5 verse 21, sorry. And further, submit one another out of reverence to Christ. 
So both men and women, to a degree, need to submit to one another. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. That is a difficult sentence. Submit to your husband as unto God. Yo. That is so authoritarian. That is scary. But wait. Just wait. For, a husband, for the husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body, the church. As Christ submits, as the church, all of us, submits to Christ, so wives, you should submit to your husbands in everything. And all the women are thinking, I thought you said you were going to the men. Here we go. Verse 25, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave up his life for her. Suddenly the wife's role doesn't seem so bad. To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word, he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. God gave his everything. Jesus died so that us, the church, could be without fault for God's eyes. In the same way, husbands, you ought to love your wives as they, uh, the husbands need to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For the man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares it, just as Christ cares for the church. Men, we need to step up. We need to be better. We need to love women the way that they deserve and the way that they respond, not the way that we think that they should. What do they need? Christ died because that's what we needed. Selfishness has got nothing to do with us. Men, as we lead, we need to lead by putting them first above all else. And women, wouldn't it be easy to follow a man who puts you first? I'm going to give a very bad example, but... For example, the guys who fixed our fridge. I would be more than happy to go and get a tool so that he could finish the job that he's doing for me sooner. Because I'm helping him to help me. That's essentially what a marriage is. We are helping one another to help one another. And wouldn't that be beautiful if it is seen practically as it should be and as it can be through the enablement of the Holy Spirit? And then it carries on back to Colossians. Children, always obey your parents, for it pleases the Lord. Obviously, this is speaking to unmarried couples. When you get married, it says in Genesis, you leave your father and your mother. Always have respect for your parents, always. But when you get married, you become a new family. And very often this causes the most difficulties in families because they don't leave. You get married, but you still have an authority there. Husbands, you're the new authority. Step up in the way that Jesus wants us to. Not authoritarian, you're not Fidel Castro or whatever. You're the husband. You're the representative of Christ in your home to give your wife to the Lord perfect without blemish. Now I'm going to be speeding up a bit. And it says, fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, Obey your earthly masters in everything you do. For us, that's workers. In everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching. See, people have always been the same. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Why do you do your job well? Because my boss is watching me or because I don't want to lose my job? No, because I have a fear of the Lord. Verse 23. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. We hear these things, but we don't take them serious enough. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your, as your reward, and that your master, the master you are serving is Christ. Everything we do is unto the Lord. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done, for God has no favorites. Essentially saying that God has ordained to some degree some form of karma. <laughs> what you reap, you will sow. And then ending off in ver ch chapter 4, verse 1 of Colossians. Masters, be just and fair to your slaves, 
and remember that you have a master in heaven. In short, do everything as unto the Lord. Everything we do. No part of being a Christian is about ourselves, regardless of what some churches might teach. Even our salvation isn't about us. It's about glorifying the God, because when we are saved, He gets glorified. And when we get saved, we have the responsibility to get Him more. It's never about us. We bear fruit for others. And it's easy for us to use and think about these instructions as legalism. But I feel that we need to look at to why these things are important. And that's, that's actually the message for today. Because I wanted to stress, this is what the Bible is teaching, how we do it. But until we understand why and how these things fit together, there will always be the thing that Johan or the Bible says that we need to do, but I don't really agree with because of my insecurities and because I struggle. We need, we need to understand how these things come together. And I feel that the following scriptures help this very much. I want to look at Romans 12, verse 3 to 10. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, Paul speaking, I give each of you this warning. I love how he says, the privilege I have to give you this warning. Because he's not stuck with insecurities. He's realizing, I am thankful that I have the opportunity to tell you that if you forget this, you are going to lose track. If you have the opportunity to warn someone you, you're going to drift off the road, that's an opportunity to save a life. It's not I'm trying to be this authority over you. It's trying to share with you in love. And then Paul says, don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given you. We need to understand that everything we have, even our faith, is given to us by God. And here comes the core text. Just as our bodies have many parts, and many parts, uh, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. There's the key text. We all belong to each other. If my foot is injured, everything suffers. Everything. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, it means to hear, to hear Him and to share His word. God has given you the ability to prophesy. Speak out with as much faith as He has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. That's a difficult text because we don't think that serving is a gift that God has given me for the church. I think about the ladies who so often and with love clear up afterwards with the cups and cleaning there at the back. That is literally glorifying God because you are serving. doesn't feel like it because only the guy at stage or doing worship, that, that, that's the guy who gets it. No. I can tell you one thing, the face doesn't care so much if the stomach is sore or if the knee is injured. These things are what are important. If your gift is serving others, serve well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage, some of you are just great at encouraging people. My wife is one of them. Encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. All the men are thinking to their wives, that's not you. Stop. It says giving, not buying. There's a difference. It's a joke. Notice, and by the way, notice that gifts, there is not a gift of receiving. Because very often we just want. We just want. We go to church and I want. And I, I'm looking for a church that can give this, and I'm looking for a spouse that can give me this. These gifts are to be given. If God has given you the leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. Some of you have the ability, this God-given ability to lead people. Where are you leading people? To heaven or to hell? We need to understand this. These are gifts that God has given us. And if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Who here can vouch that some people are not kind? Some of you have the gift of kindness. So be kind. Sometimes the best thing that you can ever give someone is a smile because they need it. 
And don't just pretend to love others, really love them. I always find it interesting. The reason they have to put this in here is because we don't do this naturally. Hate what is wrong and hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring one another. But you see what happens very often, we read these things and we think that it's a cultural thing or I'll use it in the appropriate time. I want to urge all of us to not lean on our own understanding. We read in Proverbs 3 verse 5 to 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do and He will show you the path to take. I mention this is because it's so easy for us to look at submitting to our husbands or loving our wives. They, they don't deserve it. Like they don't. Or whichever way you go, like they don't deserve it. We reason it out. Stop leaning on our own understanding. Just be the Christian you are called to be. I'm going to close off with two stories, and it's not going to be in the next two minutes. Just, I don't want to be that guy. But there's two stories that I feel are vitally important, and it's speaking about Peter in the beginning of Jesus' ministry and at the end, that I feel highlights what I feel that God wants to share with us this morning so clearly. We read in Luke 5, verse 3 to 8, stepping into one of the boats. So Jesus was just preaching to a whole lot of people. Then he steps into one of the boats, and Jesus asks Simon, Simon Peter, its owner, the boat's owner, to push it into the water. So, um, so he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out there where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. We know the story. Don't run ahead of me. Just wait. Master, Simon replied, we worked, all, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. I would like us to realize the fact that Peter was not well rested and life was good at this stage when God gave him an instruction. He was tired through working all night. He was cleaning his nets, and by the time he was sort of finished, this guy jumped in his boat and started teaching people. He was on his way home. This was not what he was expecting his day to be like. I can only imagine him being frustrated when the guy first got in, but at the same time, there's a lot of people wanting to listen to him, so I'm feeling thankful as well. We need to put ourselves in the reality of the situation. So he's tired. It doesn't feel like the right situation, and God is giving him an instruction that doesn't make sense. Very much like, love your wives with care. Sometimes that's how it feels. Submit to your husbands. Nobody's a fool. He might be a fool. It's not the point. Simon's response was, but if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. That is the type of people we need to be. If you say so, I'll do it. I don't agree. I think he's a fool. But if you say so, I'll do it. And this time the nets were so full of the fish, uh, so full of fish, they began to tear. The nets were tearing so full it was. Often the Lord will ask us to do something that to us doesn't make sense and we might not agree with it. That's not the question. The question is follow Jesus and what he says. A shout for help brought their partners from the other boats, and soon both boats were filled with fish on, and were on the verge of sinking. That's a lot of fish from doing something that you thought was stupid or didn't make sense. That's not the question. When Simon Peter realized what happened, he fell at his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me, I'm such a sinful man. Because when we realize who God is, we realize how useless we are. And I'm saying this in a world where we are taught that Jesus loves you so much and he's so glad to have you on your team. That's not the same Jesus. He loves you, but you don't deserve anything. He is great and we need to be, Lord, please take me now. Forgive me. And Jesus' ministry continues. And there's a point where Jesus denies Jesus three times. We've spoken about the story. So 
They were discipled. They've seen Jesus do miracles. They've seen him raise the dead. They, they spent day and night with him, day and night with him. Everything was good. And then Peter denies Jesus three times. And then Jesus is crucified in front of them. Their only hope, he dies. Despite the fact that he told them he would be crucified and be raised on the third day, it still didn't make sense to them. Despite the fact that Jesus had appeared to them twice after his resurrection, you still find Peter and the gang back at work fishing, choosing their old lives. And that's where we pick up in John chapter 21. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but his disciples couldn't see who he was. And he called out, Fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat. Obviously, they were doing it on the left-hand side, which apparently was also the wrong side. Who of you know that there's not a big difference between fish there and fish there? I'm not a fisherman, but I could sort of figure that part out. Throw your nets out on the right side of the boat and you'll get some. And you can see the preconditioning that has happened over the years because there's this fool on the bank shouting, throw it on the other side of the boat and sort of just out of sar sarcasm, I can imagine, oh, throw it. And they couldn't hold the net because it was so full of fish. When we follow Jesus' instruction, things turn out differently. Despite the fact that we might be doing something that looks so similar and we get no result. You can be submitting to your husband because that's what you think you need to do. And there's failure because you think that I need to because you're scared of him or this or that. If your heart isn't at the right place, you're not going to have fish. If you buy your wife flowers and it's not because of the heart, it's not going to have the same thing. It's, it's, it's not. But if we do stuff in everyday life because that's what Jesus said and that's what our heart is, the result will always be different. I'm not saying you'll always have a big load or a lot of fish, but the result will always be different because now you are following the instructions of God and being led by the Spirit. Success comes from following God's instructions, regardless of whether we understand it or agree with it or not. When God says, love your wife, treat her so. When God says, submit to your husband, do so. For those of you who are not married, when the Lord says, go have a cup of coffee with someone, do it. When the Lord says, commit to whatever it is that I have entrusted you with, then commit. Realize that sometimes, when I'm jumping ahead, Verse 7, then the disciples, then the disciple that, that Jesus loved, speaking of John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Then Simon, when Simon Peter heard it, that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, which is his sort of Roman dress thingy, because he had stripped for work. He jumped in the water and headed to shore. The other stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to shore. For they were only about a hundred yards from the shore. Do you realize for a moment just what happened? They were on the boat the whole night. It was a sucky night. They're tired. They caught nothing. Then this random guy shouts, throw it on the other side. There you go. Then you have this net that you can't really, you, you can't get it up. Yet Peter still needed his fellow to tell him that it's Jesus. He didn't click. This is why we are a church. Sometimes we need one another to highlight something that now, in retrospect, of course it's Jesus. And the person who denied Jesus three times, the one who was feeling the most sinful, was the one who jumped in the water and went first. Because he realized who he was. That's why the rest were sort of, I'm glad it's Jesus, but let's take the fish. Because we're not sure what to do in the situation. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire. Don't judge him. Like, we can't judge people who brow on charcoal anymore because that's what Jesus did. I'm just saying. As much as I want to. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire. Yo, now people can take that out of context. It's like, you can't brow with wood. 
You can. Don't. In any case, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. This was a test. This is what this was. I'm kidding. In any case, with some bread. And then Jesus said to them, bring some fish. Bring some of the fish you've caught. Jesus said. So Simon Peter went, ab went aboard and dragged the net to shore. And there were 153 large fish. And the net hadn't torn. It reminds me of when Jesus said, my, my sheep know my, know my voice and I will not lose one. I think this is what it means. Like when Jesus sends you to catch, you'll catch if you follow his instructions. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of his disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. So obviously there was something different with his face. But as we saw with other scriptures, we can see that he still had his scars. But there was something different about him. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. And this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he was raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. And take care of my sheep, Jesus said. The third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked him this question a third time. Sometimes God is going to ask us something that hurts to help it sink in. Not because he doesn't love us, but because we need to realize something. Peter was hurt that Jesus asked him this question for a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. I believe Jesus was essentially saying to him that if you really love me, then keep, care for my people more than you get fixated on your faults. Care about my people. This is not about you and your insecurities. You know I love you. And then Jesus does something like there was this moment where he, I think that they were connecting and I think Peter was clicking what Jesus was saying and then Jesus comes with this left hook, plot twist if you will, and he says, I tell you the truth, when you were young you were able to do as you liked and you dressed yourself and you went whatever, wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to let him know what kind of death he would glorify God with. And then Jesus said, told him, follow me. So church tradition and history teaches us, it's not in the Bible, but it's in church history, and I believe it to be true, that Peter was crucified later in his life. But because he didn't feel worthy to die the same death as Jesus, he asked to be crucified upside down. It's very difficult. Who can imagine that this must be tough? Because Jesus is literally telling you, like, you just told me I love you, but now you're telling me how I'm going to die. And it might not sound like it to us, but they knew. Because as we see, Peter immediately turned around and saw behind him the disciple Jesus loved, John, the one, obviously, God doesn't have favorites, but he, to a degree, might do. The one who leaned over Jesus during supper and asked them, who will betray you? And Jesus asked, oh, and Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? Because that's what we do. The moment God gives us an instruction or gives us a word, we immediately start pushing it on someone else. Lord, well, what about him? Like, if I'm going to die, how's he going to die? And Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? As for you, follow me. It's not our, our responsibility to get fixated on our infirmities or to get fixated on the faults of others. It is our responsibility to follow the Lord's instruction whether we understand it or not, whether we agree with it or not. What is it to you if your husband is useless? That's not the question. Submit in reverence for the Lord to your husband. Husbands, realize that the way that you're treating your wife tells the Lord how you're treating 
him because that's his daughter. The way that we live our life, whether we take someone out for a cup of coffee or not, what the Lord is laying on your heart, how are we following his instructions? Yes, we are called to see each other's faults as we see in 2 Corinthians where they say that we should help a brother out of sin. Yes, that is true. We should do those things. But not lose track of what the Lord has laid on our hearts. We are to focus on the task that is given us. And this morning I'm going to ask you today, what is God asking of you or what has he been asking of you? In the same way, of what has he been asking of me? Is he asking you to respect your spouse more? Is God asking you to say sorry to someone who doesn't deserve it? For the ladies, are you submitting the way that you feel God wants you to submit? Stop taking over and taking something that shouldn't. Is God asking you to forgive someone, once again, who doesn't deserve it? Is God asking you to forgive yourself? Because very often this can be the most difficult. Is God asking you to stop smoking or stop that bad habit that you have? Is God asking you to invite someone over for dinner and to love someone? Is He asking you to connect more with your church, regardless of how you feel about it? What is God laying on your heart this morning? Because I feel that once we start stepping into these things, that's when we achieve the greatness that I spoke about in the beginning. When we take those daily steps of adhering and sacrificing ourselves for the Lord, because today's message is not about getting women in line or getting men to step up. At the heart of what I feel God is calling us to is to stop leaning on our own understanding of how we do life. To stop questioning God and just follow His instructions regardless of how we feel or what we think, but rather realize I need to change the way I think and realize that whatever He says is right. He's never wrong. And then the result will be so much different. Because it's not about us as individuals. But then at the same time, I want to close off with this. If you're sitting here today, even as I'm standing here today, thinking about what the Lord is laying on your heart, realize, above all else, please don't forget that He loves you more than anything else, to the point where He gave Himself so much more than you can ever. He wants us to succeed. This should not be, oh no, I'm doing a horrible job. Remember what Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. It's not about you. Realize I love you, now carry on, feed my sheep. <coughs> love my people, love your wife, love your church, love the people in Bathurst that you don't like. It doesn't say like them, it says love them. Extend this offer of salvation to them, get to know them. Live a life that shines his light. And may we stop reasoning things and start, stop reasoning things from our insecurities from the past. And may we just trust Him and say, Lord, if I got hurt, I know you'll pick me up. That's what the Lord is calling us to. Let's be excited about this. Let's close our eyes and pray. Dear Lord, I want to say thank you so much that you want us to succeed, Lord. Thank you that you want to improve our marriages, Lord. Thank you that you want us to succeed in living your life, Lord. Being those Christians that don't think about ourselves, but think about you and your people, Lord, because you love all of us, Lord. Help us hear you clearly, Lord. Help us obey you, Lord. Help us accept your love, Lord, and in return also share it with those around us. Lord, I pray where we have weaknesses, where we struggle, Lord, Step in and take over, Lord. Help us to allow you to change us. Encourage us this morning and don't let us be disheartened. If you're sitting here this morning, I want to encourage you. Just pray to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me be better. Because I can guarantee you this. Every single one here is probably thinking the same thing. And if you're not... I almost want to ask you, why not? Even as I'm standing here, Lord, please help me in my, in my lack of faith sometimes. In the way that I treat my wife, help me be better. Lord, help each and every one of us be who you want us to be so that together we can be the church that you want us to be, so that we can save the people that you want to save, Lord. 
I thank you for that, Lord. Amen.